Uh, my name is Rich Detizio. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Institute. And uh, on behalf of Mike and my fellow panelists, I want to welcome you to our session on strategic philanthropy. Uh, philanthropy has been a guiding light at the Institute uh, for quite some time, working with people who are significant and nascent stage philanthropists around the world. We, earlier this year, actually created the eighth center of the Institute, the Center for Strategic Philanthropy, really focusing on helping people think through efficacy metrics around their giving. Uh, how do you create sustainability versus dependency when you're funneling funds towards causes that you care about? Uh, and really in a cause agnostic way, not opining on what people are giving to you, but really focusing on how. So coming from the United States, where we have 1.6 million nonprofit organizations uh, currently in, that are functioning, uh, if that were happening in the commercial space, you would have seen a wave of M&A activities sweep through and strip out a lot of the duplicated expenses, particularly on the administrative side, and then really funnel more money directly towards the causes that you're trying to uh, fund. Uh, we haven't seen that yet, so what we try and help people to do is think through synergistically where are the strategic partnerships that you might deploy? Who are the partners you should be looking for and where do they reside? And where are the best practices in the world that are focused? If we can think through how to really uh, optimize the money that is going towards collective causes, there don't need to be thousands of organizations targeting the same thing. So with that as a backdrop, people often come to us at the early stages when they've had some sort of transition event and have the liquidity that they can start thinking about philanthropy. Uh, so I'd like to start with you, Mike, um, because so many people come to you for that advice at that inflection point. Uh, we were together in New York a few months ago uh, at the philanthropy session Forbes did, and you clearly laid out three different strategies people might embark upon at the beginning stages. So why don't you start with that, and we'll go from there. Uh, thank you, Rich. And I think one of the first elements is what do you have passion for? Um, there are a lot of challenges in philanthropy. Uh, some people uh, would, don't want to be distracted. You know, I would put, and to a certain degree, Warren Buffett in that area. Uh, he's co-investing with Gates Foundation, uh, and he gets to do what he enjoys in his life, um, which is his business and investing, et cetera. And so it isn't take away from what he likes to do, and he, he has someone else uh, devoted to that activity. Um, I think in, in terms of the paths to go down is recognizing philanthropy has enormous leveraging capability. And it isn't just dollars, it's really focused heavily uh, on your time and effort and your skill set. And therefore, one of the least productive parts of philanthropy, I would say, occurs in medical research, which is the grateful patient. So you have a doctor, they've treated you, or you're the doctor, he or she might be a phenomenal clinician, but isn't gonna solve the problem of that disease. And so the grateful patient is supporting those that have taken care of them, uh, but they're not qualified to do research to solve the problem. So in coming back, I think first having passion. Uh, the second thing I, I feel in philanthropy is how to leverage your philanthropy. There's a great deal of dollars around. If we just look at medical philanthropy, in the United States, um, medical philanthropy is only about 3% of total philanthropy. But because it's venture, it often sets the stage. So small amounts of money a few million dollars to proof of concept, then it often meets both government funding and then industry funding. And so numerous times where we've put up anywhere from one to $10 million, over a billion dollars then has been matched to invest in that area. And so it's the ability to make quick decisions. I step back and really think about what are the key issues of a society. And it starts with the major asset of that society, the human beings that are in that society. And so first, if we can get people living longer, healthier, higher quality lives, we can dramatically change the world. And as you'll hear quite often during our conferences around the world, 
uh, medical research and public health is accountable for more than 50% of all economic growth. And one of the amazing things, when you reflect back on it, uh, is in four million years of human evolution, we only extended average lifespan by 11 years. In the last 100 or so years, we've extended it by uh, 40 years. And so this acceleration of length of life and quality of life. I think the second element of human capital is education. And this is what I believe is one of the main challenges of the next 20 to 30 years. And I know a number of you with us today have worked in this area. But can people feel they have meaningful, productive lives? And as we interview 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds today, they are especially focused on this area. And so the challenges of a world in technology and a flattening of the world, I'd say the second area, Rich, is can we give people the skills to provide them an opportunity for a productive and meaningful life to them? Can we create jobs? And so there's the old adage, oh, we're going to teach you how to fish instead of just give you fish. Uh, but the creation of jobs and opportunities and realizing that almost all job creation in the world starts in small and medium type businesses. And how do you uh, provide, in many cases, small amounts of money really that start what turns out to be large enterprises that employ people. And the last element of that human capital equation is really immigration uh, and people move. And so for me, the discussion of immigration really starts for us in the United States. Why did 50 million people come to the United States from Europe? Religious freedom, opportunity, entrepreneurism, uh, growth opportunities, a better life for they and their family. And so the American dream of an opportunity to succeed, not based on your religion, not based on who your parents are, where you went to school, uh, your race or gender, um, and a chance to fail and, and try again. And so I'd like uh, just to have one diversion here for a moment, Rich. And many years ago, almost 27 years ago now, uh, Gorbachev and the commissar in charge of commerce and industry in Soviet Union came and I visited with them with Dr. Hammer who was the CEO of, of Occidental at the time at the Russian embassy and they wanted to create new businesses this was the late 1980s and so they wanted to know whether philanthropy or investment could help create new industries new businesses new opportunities so their first idea was water they had seen Avion, the success of Avion. They had all this water in Siberia. Maybe they could supply water to the world. And this was shortly after Chernobyl. And I told them I didn't think the world right now was ready for water from the Soviet Union uh, with the concern of quality, et cetera. So we next moved to venture capital and starting new businesses. And I mentioned to him, you have to realize that as much as seven out of 10 of those businesses fail. Uh, and so the commissar told me, do you put the people at the company in jail if they fail? And I told him, I didn't think you were ready for venture capital. Uh, whether it was finance, philanthropy, from, or for for-profit at this time. Uh, so. I think what you can do a lot for a society, but ultimately it's the people in the society and the human capital that are the major factors. And why are people migrating from North Africa, the Middle East, Asia, uh, to Europe and the UK today? It's really the social capital. These same reasons that many people went to the United States in the 19th century. Uh, but if you can deal with those three, uh, education, healthcare, and focused on trying to attract the best and brightest to work on something, I think you find your philanthropy is very successful, no different than a for-profit business.
So I, I think that last point is important and one that we find critical in advising people is that I think the inflection point philanthropy is at is going from the historic check writing passive money of the past to active money, which is much more activist in nature, demanding accountability, and setting uh, the stage for impact. And it's curious how often the people who have the means to devote significant resources towards philanthropy do not apply the business principles which got them to that stage to their philanthropy. And I think there's a distaste oftentimes. People feel that requiring accountability is somehow distasteful and taints the gift. But I can assure you that by demanding accountability is the only way to get things self-sustaining. And unless you want to create a dependency factor that keeps you funding ad infinitum and keeps people wed to the cause and not the cure, uh, you need to start doing that. And I think, uh, Tom, one of the things that you've done at the Hunter Foundation is set aside 5% for really developing those uh, metrics to determine efficacy. So why don't you tell us how you came about doing that and what the success has been? Yeah, thanks, Rich. Um, I guess when we were trying to work it out, and we were trying to work it out, because um, when, you know, when I started selling shoes in the back of a van, I had to teach myself how to get a very large van by the end of it. And, um, but then, at the age of 37, having a big liquidity event, I had to work out what the purpose of continuing to work was. You know, I, I didn't think myself and my family needed any more personal wealth. But we decided that we wanted to still be in business, but the money would flow through to the foundation. So that was a pretty fundamental um, decision that we made as a family. And we decided that our children wouldn't be burdened with great wealth. Um, and I think Warren Buffett got it about right when he said, leave your kids enough that they do something, but not too much that they do nothing. And I think that's... Um, trying to find that balance is an ongoing um, debate in the Hunter house household. So, um, and I'm sure it will be for years to come. But once we started to get into philanthropy, I mean, something we talked about yesterday, Rich, that there wasn't too many people about in Scotland to learn from. Because I've always been someone who said, right, go to the best, find out what they're doing and, and learn. Um, and there wasn't too much about. So I had to go into the past to, um, and, and, I, and I found Andrew Carnegie, um, who was a Scotsman, who left Scotland penniless, went to the US, became the richest guy in the world, and, um, but decided that he needed to put his money to work while he was still alive, which I thought was really um, fundamental. So I think it was my dad that said to me, because we were struggling, because there's so many good causes and people would come and say, will you do this, Tom, will you do that? And we wrote a check and we never knew if it made any difference. There was no feedback. And then he said, well, well why don't you treat it as a business, son? Why, you, you wouldn't, if somebody came to you with a business idea, write a check and hope for the best. You wouldn't do it. So why, why are you doing it in your charitable giving? So we just decided at that point um, to treat it as a business. We treat it as an investment and we measure. Because if you're not measuring outcomes, you're, you're doing the charity a disservice. And um, I always remember, you know, we have some interesting debates with the charity, but um, somebody once said to me, he who has the pesos has the sesos. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not a Spanish speaker, but um, that kind of resonated with me. And now, in our philanthropic giving, we, we dedicate 5% of anything to outside. So people who are going to tell us, Tom, you're doing a lousy job here um, because we've got to learn. So if it's a three-year um, commitment, we, we drip feed the money in over 6, 12, 18, 24 months, and we have milestones to hit. And we review it after six months to say, are we where we thought we would be? Yes, no, maybe and we take corrective action. Just, just what we would do in our business life. Now, some people don't want to do that, and that's fine, and so we don't fund it. I, we're pretty hard-headed about it. Um, but for me, 
the outcomes of our philanthropic giving are even more important than the outcomes of our for-profit investments. And therefore, the measurement, the results are just too important just to write a check and hope. Rich, I'd like to follow up on that just for one second here. There's been a lot of reports recently about major philanthropic gifts in the United States that had actually no outcomes, in many cases negative outcomes in the area of education. And so public school education is a five to six hundred billion dollar industry and there is no foundation, even the largest in the world, or even Gates plus Buffett, that, del that delivers large amounts of money relative to the size. And so one of the keys is to understand how you can affect things uh, in very large, and we're large amounts of money. And so we really focused on the teacher and over a 40 year period determined that most of the outcomes are based on the quality of teacher in the classroom. Can we elevate the self image of a teacher and created these quote Academy Award for teachers uh, from that standpoint. And I think it's very important, following up on Tom's comment, uh, best practices. In medical research area, you have numerous duplications of things that have already been discovered didn't work that people are duplicating. And so trying to share information. And many years ago, when we launched many of our medical foundations, uh, we concluded that if you didn't share annually, what you had done, which would be measure. If you didn't share annually, then we couldn't fund you. And so it was interesting. As I traveled around, a number of people said, well, their work is too important. It's going to be published in Cell or Nature, and therefore they couldn't share. And I told them that was really not an issue because uh, your work is so important and so breakthrough that you would have no trouble raising money. Our money is for those that aren't as well known, and maybe work is not as important. Within six months, everyone agreed to share. So <laughs> I think the areas when you say three to begin, Rich, are rolling up your sleeves. And I think Tom talked about that as a business. Seeking out best practices, let's find out what else has been done. And three, unleashing creative activity. And I say this is really the leadership. No different in for-profit. You get great leaders, creative people, they will succeed whether it's nonprofit or for-profit. You have poor leadership, poor management, uh, they will seize defeat out of the jaws of victory uh, every time. Well, I, I think when we focus on education, let's stay on that for a moment, because the scale of the problem is so significant that it's often hard to think like what drop in the bucket you're going to add to the equation. So you also you have to match scale with scale. And I think leveraging technology today, Facebook has hundreds of millions of individual users each month. If you could find a way to tap into the tiniest fraction of those people and accelerate funding towards something that you're interested in, technology needs to be your friend in philanthropy and you need to leverage it. Uh, Igor, that brings us to you. Uh, more in the nascent stages of, of your journey, but thinking through World Quant University, leveraging technology to get to scale. Why don't you tell us how you came up with the idea, why you, you found that was going to be the, the mechanism to do so, and then how you're going to judge the efficacy of your effort. Sure. So to understand uh, what World Quant University is, uh, I think it's necessary to understand what World, World Quant is. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm a quant, and World Quant is a one of the world's uh, uh, leading quantitative investment uh, management firms. So we... So the name is good, that world's part. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. It's to the point, yeah. We, we measure everything, and the amount of data, you know, uh, has been uh, growing, growing over time, and uh, there's, uh, there's more and more to measure. So measurement is kind of like our lifeline. So uh, when we go from, uh, from uh, the business world to the philanthropy world, the same uh, concepts apply, and uh, to, to, to me, it's just uh, an extension. I want to apply exactly the same principles to uh, to the philanthropic uh, World Quant uh, University efforts as, as uh, we apply inside World Quant. Now, what, what is World Quant University? World Quant University is uh, the world's first to be accredited uh, master's degree program in uh, 
computer in the quantitative uh, finance. And uh, the, key, the key words there are that it'll be free to everybody. And uh, how are we able to do that? It's not because we're any giant foundation, but because it's uh, very carefully designed to scale. And uh, scaling is a, is a measure of, of efficiency. And we want this, this idea to be able to reach first hundreds, then thousands, then tens of thousands, uh, then uh, millions of people. Now, uh, measurements. There's so many, uh, so much data out there. You can, you can start measuring things uh, left and right. There are 100 people in this room. You know, temperatures, uh, 60 degrees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you can also uh, be measuring uh, all kinds of statistics. But in finance, you know, we measure something called the Sharpe ratio, information ratio, which just to define it is is your average return on investment divided by the variability of investment. So uh, I would like to use the same concept to measure the efficacy of the philanthropic effort. Uh, when we look at the students, uh, we uh, take their salary versus uh, the salary of the uh, average person in the region. And we compute uh, how, how much improvement are we uh, producing in the region? What's, what's the average improvement? And what's, what's the deviation of this improvement? And that's the sharp ratio. So the same uh, concept uh, should be applied in the philanthropy as, as are applied in uh, business, uh, because uh, in business, you get very direct uh, feedback. But in philanthropy, everybody says thank you all the time when you have to uh, kind of dig in and uh, see what's important and, uh, and what's not. And uh, as far as scaling is, you know, uh, starting on a fairly uh, small budget forces you to be efficient and advantages. It forces you to design things correctly. So if it's designed correctly to begin with and if it's going to be scaling, the, the plan is uh, after we get this one program off the ground, we will uh, find partners and we will uh, scale the approach and that it should scale significantly. And the speed with which you're going to be able to accomplish that, if you were to contrast that to 50 years ago prior to the internet even existing, if you had to deliver books and teachers around the world, you'd be, it would be impossible to do. So I, but some, at some point, someone else is going to have to pick up this ball and, like to, and take the education through. Tom, you focus on this a lot. I think to Mike's point, when you think about what philanthropic dollars can do to be the catalyst and then deploying leverage, yeah. at some point, the issues that, that you're trying to tackle are going to need governmental intervention to pick up and, and take over. So walk, yeah. walk us through some of the partnerships that you're seeking in that vein. Sure. So, I mean, the first point to, to Mike is talking about sharing, which is part of what attracts me to the Milken Institute. Because when we started down the road of looking at education, we wasted a lot of money <coughs> looking at the wrong things. Whereas if I'd spoke to Mike or Bill Gates, who I've now subsequently spoke to, the teacher is the silver bullet. But I didn't know that. But I could have saved myself a lot of millions of dollars, Mike, if I'd spoken to you. Um, so where were you? <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> um, so what, what, what we try and do in Scotland, and Scotland is a, is a small country, so what we try and do is look at best practice around the world. So we, we share information with the Gates Foundation, I'm now going to share it with um, Mike and his institute, about where's the best practice in the world and, and can we bring it to Scotland? And what we've done in the past with the Scottish government is we have said, look, we will be the venture philanthropy. Um, we will take the risk because governments don't like risk and they really don't like failure. So if it fails, it will be our failure. The government will not be tarnished. But if it works and if we prove that it works, and we have our metrics up front, which will be validated by an outside body, um, you will adopt it as policy. Because we are not substitute for the taxpayer, but we can take the risk in the initial stages. So that's something that's worked pretty well for us in Scotland, and we're beginning to do more of it. 
Um, because in the world of education, our, our, where we start from, if, if one of the key points of education is to prepare our young people for the world of work, well, guess what? The world of work is absolutely unrecognisable. You were telling me that the stats now tell us someone will have seven careers, not seven jobs, but seven different careers entering the world of work today. So in Scotland, we still give our children seven weeks holiday in the summer to go pick potatoes in the fields. Well, guess what? Um, I did used to pick potatoes in the fields and I almost got caught once because um, I wasn't supposed to be. But how many of our kids pick potatoes anymore? Maybe just don't. So the world of education needs to catch up with, it's really important because um, my whole thing is about if we're gonna have economic prosperity, it comes from small companies who are more innovative, who create the breakthroughs. And therefore preparing our young people to work in small teams, in entrepreneurial teams, they, these are skills which should be taught at school so that when the young people go into a startup, a scale up, they make a contribution straight away. And I'm afraid we're not good at doing that in the UK. Um, better in other parts of the world. But we want to find best practice, bring it to this country, and then scale. But you need government to scale. I think uh, on that point, Rich, um, one of our companies, which is in the tutoring supplemental education business in Singapore, what we have seen here is a dramatic change in what students are interested in. We have 10 times as many students interested in coding and robotics as certain traditional subjects such as chemistry, biology, 10 times. And when I was in Singapore for our Asian summit, the Milken Institute Asian Summit, they had classes just for kids from six to 12, separated, six to 12 in coding uh, and in robotics. And when I visited some of our schools um, in the United States recently, I visited with the robotics class, 10 and 11th graders, every single one of them had formed their own company either between sixth grade or 10th grade. And I think Igor has a really important uh, opportunity here in that we need to focus on the 21st century, not the 17th, 18th, or 19th, or even the 20th century. And the technology that Tom and Igor are focused on will totally revolutionize healthcare, your bank, uh, your power, how you get power, uh, et cetera, and education. And we need to focus in that area, in an area that Igor has pioneered, big data. More and more decisions will be made by having knowledge of big data. Uh, that, and once your financial world is on your mobile device, It'll be very easy to measure your credit by where you buy purchases, when you pay, et cetera, your entire pattern. When your health is on your device, it'll be easier to monitor uh, these things. And, and I think philanthropy in many ways needs to move into the 21st century. We have to make sure that what we're doing from a philanthropic standpoint is not preparing people for jobs that are not gonna exist or a world that's not going to exist. And I think, Tom, well, if we're going to help people learn, we have to have them have a love of learning, not a love of a lot of facts. Because if they're going to be challenged in different careers, they're going to be constantly learning in their lifetime and will be frustrated if they've been trained on a lot of facts that are no longer relevant in this century. Okay, I want to uh, talk a little bit about innovation. As, as you said, Mike, I, I think that philanthropy as a space has been lacking more innovative thought. If you think through something as simple as, as what the ALS board meeting might have looked like in 2014 when someone said, 
I've got a great idea. I'm going to have people put ice in a bucket of ice water and dump it on my head, and everyone's going to film it, and we're going to earn $100 million by doing that. I mean, that, that would have sounded crazy at the inception, but in fact, that's exactly what happened. And I think the innovation can be as simple as that towards fundraising or as complex as some of the interesting mechanisms that we're seeing in the way things get funded. So, Igor, I want to go to you. Why not just write a check and, and donate to a university, as so many people do, uh, and fund education that way? Like, what, what was the stimulus for you to say, I'm thinking differently about this, and I want this to be different? Well, we went uh, through a kind of a evolution, right? So first, there was, there was a foundation. And so we were trying to decide how to achieve the most impact. And uh, it, it became clear that the impact is through education because education spans many generations and changes lives. Uh, so we started out first doing exactly that. We were giving out scholarships. Uh, but then we uh, got involved uh, with a massive, uh, with MOOCs, massive online uh, courses. And that uh, became uh, more and more evident with time that uh, just the whole system was uh, antiquated and not ready to deal with uh, the challenges that are coming up in, in, in the next century. Things are changing so quickly that by the time uh, you, know, you finish uh, your, your degree, it's a completely different set of information. And how can you really deal with that except through a very, uh, very uh, efficient system? So uh, when, uh, when it became obvious that that was the, the realization, the decision was made to, uh, to go ahead and uh, do it. And the challenge uh, was to do it on a, on a, on a very low budget. But uh, I think challenges are good because they force you to innovate. Rich, I just want to pick up on what Igor said. Uh, if I take you back 22 years in medical research and how that's changed today, if you wanted to apply, let's say, to the National Institute of Health, the largest funded medical research group in the United States, and it funds around the world, you might have to take 18 months to prepare your submission. You need proof of concept. It could be we saw a submission that was nine feet high, et cetera. Now, they might take 18 months to decide whether you were going to have funded. And let's say they decided you were funded. Uh, it's now three to three and a half years later. You were required to do what you said you're going to do, even if it's obsolete. So what we said then, OK, how about you could, we only promise to read the first five pages. Uh, you can give us nine feet, but we only promise to read the first five pages. We will fund an idea. You don't have to have a proof of concept. And we will let you know in 60 days and fund you within 90. Now you attract the best and brightest to work because they weren't going to spend a year and a half developing a report. And they know quickly where they have money. And they now can work on what's current rather than what's the past. And so a lot of the activity that's set into motion, particularly with governments, is when you send a proposal, you have to do what you said you're going to do in the proposal, even if it isn't applicable. Uh, any longer. And so this is a challenge. Now, today, many of the government institutions we work with, particularly in 19 countries, have their fast track program. So the response has, has changed dramatically. I think one of the other areas we haven't discussed is how do you stop funding something? If you fund it, they can become highly dependent on you. And how do you stop that funding? And one of the things that we've done at the Milken Family Foundation, um, when we started it um, 35 years ago, hard to believe, uh, was a five year and out program. We would tell you up front that we will only fund for five years. If no one else in the world cares, well, it must not have been a very good program. And you have to reach out to others. And many of the best programs we ever launched 
children with learning disabilities and other challenges have grown because of the talent of the individual running them and the fact that we let them know we might be funding 50% in year one and in year six, a half of 1%. They became independent and had the metrics that Tom was talking about in order to go out and get funding. And, and philanthropy doesn't have to be unidirectional check writing either. The, the idea that you are creating a lifeline into these organizations uh, almost negates the idea of sustainability. So I really like the idea of recyclability of capital. When, when you're thinking through deploying philanthropic dollars where you're expecting those dollars to come back to you so that you can redeploy them, whether there's an associated return or not. Uh, next month, the Institute will be releasing into the public domain a template on medical philanthropy that is thinking through the venture philanthropy model where disease-specific organizations can take first loss positions and then <coughs> uh, accelerate returns for subsequent investors <coughs> in a very targeted, disease-specific way that will fund uh, medical research in a way that hasn't been done before. So you, uh, look forward to that. It'll be in the Milken Institute review in the fourth quarter. But the idea is modeling after something that the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation did, which many of you might be familiar with, is creating essentially a portfolio of private equity uh, companies that were working on promising but nascent stage therapies and technologies, one of which was quite successful in developing a drug called Kaleidico, which works in about four to six percent of CF-afflicted patients. They then monetized the royalty stream from that, and the CF Foundation received three billion dollars back. So it was thinking quite differently of the traditional model of just writing a check and funding people who have the disease and taking care of them. It was really much more innovative than that. So I want to go, uh, Tom, you've been thinking through innovative strategies and some of the entrepreneurial spirit you're looking for in the Hunter Foundation. How do you decide, to Mike's point, to, to stop funding something that seems like such a good idea, especially when the need is still present? Yeah, I mean, that, that is one of the biggest and hardest decisions that you're going to make. And something um, as part of my education, I went to Bangladesh to meet um, Muhammad Yunus. And I mean, he is right up there. And he, he is not only one of the best philanthropists I've ever met, he's one of the best entrepreneurs I've ever met. His mind just sees things differently. And, and what, he, what, what I took from him, what I really learned was, he said, look, Tom, if you want to write a check, that's nice, but it's a one-off event. It's a one-off event. He says, why don't you start to think about social business? Um, so these are businesses which are, um, and him and I perhaps disagree about the, um, I, I define social businesses as businesses that are for profit, but the profit goes to charitable causes. Um, because his challenge to me was then, if you use the skills that are in your head or your team's head that have made you successful in business, just apply them to a social business and that is the check that keeps giving. There's no need to stop because the business becomes self-sustaining and the charities that you decide to fund are the recipients. And I mean, that really struck with me, but that's maybe now called impact investing or whatever, but Eunice really got us to think in an innovative way and one of the strands of the Hunter Foundation now is financing social businesses. And, it, and these, these can be any business. Um, but the best ones for us work when the founders, and we're again backing entrepreneurial talent, just as the way we're doing in our for-profit business, they make it very clear that this is for-profit, but 100% of the profits are going to charitable causes and they set out their business values. And I, I've got really quite excited about this because I see almost unlimited leverage in this. And um, it's really, it plays to my skill set, um, which is backing entrepreneurial talent. So it's, it's something that's really got us excited. When I see Tom smiling here, Rich, <laughs> I think, um, the message of Mohammed Yunus is he didn't have any personal capital. He no. created a system. And I think when you talked about the ALS 
ice bucket effort. You know, if you laugh, you live longer. Okay, and so part of philanthropy is creating some excitement. Uh, in the month of November, you have Movember. So what was the challenge? How do you get young people to think about cancer, which is the second largest cause of death in the world today, when they're going to live forever uh, indestructible at a young age? Well, uh, the brilliance of this idea of growing a mustache and having parties, et cetera, around it and, um, and funding men's cancers in this way has been revolutionary and they've raised more than a half a billion and well in the way to a billion dollars. But more than that, they've allowed young people to think about the causes they're raising money for. So that excitement, and I think you should feel good about what you're doing when you, when you understand your goals. And, but it's important to understand the goals. And I would give you an example. There's been a large push here in the last few decades of getting people in the lower socioeconomic groups into university as a goal. Well, what we discovered was that you got them in university, but only 10% graduated. So you really didn't complete your effort. In the United States particularly, they left with student debt and things like that. But they didn't really have the skills. And so what we discovered starting almost 30 years ago was we needed a social safety net to support them. So when they went to college, we gave them another scholar that was a big brother or a big sister. We gave them a mentor who was an older scholar. So they had a whole group around them. And we've had a 99% success rate in people from the lowest socioeconomic group. But it wasn't just money. And it wasn't just preparing them in a high school environment. It was creating a social support network around them. And so the goal of getting them to a university was really in itself not the real goal or the end goal. The goal was that they developed a skill, self-confidence. And as Igor pointed out, you can measure their compensation versus the mean at the end of the day. So I think a lot of times people have set the wrong goals yeah. in your philanthropy. Well, when you think of just the numbers we've been tossing about, the billions and billions of dollars, if it were just money, many of these things would be caused, cured. Uh, it's really talent, as Mike said before. Like, can you attract the talent into the philanthropic space that has the wherewithal to tackle some of the most complex issues on the planet? And this is what we're really asking people to do. And then in the United States, anyway, because of the 990 form that's filed for nonprofit organizations, you are then judged on how little you pay these people. Right? So the, <laughs> you're supposed to take the most complex issues on the planet, AIDS, poverty, hunger. You toss them to a group of people that are supposed to be talented enough to handle it, and then totally dissimilarly to the private sector, you are then judged on paying them as little as you can. So I'm going to find the best talent for the cheapest price, and I'm supposed to attract people that have expenses that mirror the same expenses out there in the real world that everyone else has, and uh, it becomes quite a challenge. So it goes back to my initial point, well, then you don't need 1.6 million organizations doing it because you're just replicating all of those expenses uh, again and again. So I think one of the things that we focus on in advising people is the wake of philanthropy. Oftentimes, people are so focused on the good part. And good intention does not give you a pass from fiscal responsibility either. But there is often a negative wake in, behind many philanthropic efforts. And, and uh, Mike, I'm going to go to you, because I think we've seen many of these. But what do you think doesn't work about philanthropy when people with all the good intention and resources in the world, and then there's a lot of cleanup that needs to occur after. Well, let's, let's get two sayings on the table. One, what is the definition of a problem that you've raised? A real problem is something that cannot be solved with just money. Okay, If it's really a challenge, money cannot solve that problem. And so the challenge of getting people prepared. And second, I think a point you just brought up, Rich, 
I think in going into philanthropy, you have to know that no good deed will go unpunished, okay? <laughs> so why you were interested in the cause, et cetera, et cetera. You know, in the United States, there was a man, Boone Pickens, who I had financed over the years, and he was very focused on the United States becoming energy independent in natural gas and eliminating the half a trillion dollars to $700 billion a year in balance of payments issues, and invested about $60 million of his own money in this effort on a nonprofit basis. But he was constantly attacked that he was from the energy industry. Isn't he going to benefit if this happened? So I think if you want to be effective in philanthropy, you're going to change the world and the status quo is going to challenge you. And as you know, most changes are people have a very negative reaction to. Even, I'll give you a simple example, there were two young scientists from Australia, one from west, one from east, who said ulcers aren't caused by aggravation and other things, they're caused by bacteria. What was the first reaction of the scientific community? First, they looked at where they went to school, and I'll never forget the first headline, who are these yobos, okay? <laughs> they didn't even go to a good university. Well, four years later, they won a Nobel Prize. So part of the time, you know, if you're doing good, you're gonna, you're gonna have some challenges out there, Rich, from that standpoint, and I think one of the mistakes people make is for acceptance. They asked everyone to buy in, get acceptance. It's great if you can get it, but if you're really gonna have fundamental change, there are people that are gonna resist change. They're gonna resist Igor's online free university and <clears throat> challenge it, even though he has exciting metrics of measuring their future earning power versus the mean. Mm -hmm. They're gonna challenge Tom, mixture of for-profit, non-profit, <clears throat> that he's really benefiting from some sense. And so I think the first element I would say is once you've done your due diligence, seek out best practices, make sure if no one objects, <coughs> then you're probably not doing something great. <laughs> <clears throat> and if you're, when you talked earlier, Rich, about disease-specific organizations, the large, say, cancer general organizations did not want the creation of any disease-specific groups. They wanted you to give money to the mothership, uh, but the real change in science in the last 25 years and in care has been the strengthening of the disease-specific organizations, uh, which has been one of the great missions, as you know, of Faster Cures, because they have the interest of patients, people with life-threatening diseases, they can raise money from the constituents. To, it's a circle that has changed the world. And cystic fibrosis, prostate cancer, multiple myeloma, and so on. Mm -hmm. but, the resistance from the old. You know, we sometimes think philanthropy is new. <clears throat> in England, there was an act, in, I think it was 1613, on philanthropy, the act of 1613. And what were the requirements of that act? And so I think the key is, can we be effective in a 21st century technology-driven way. Uh, there's been a lot of changes over the years. <clears throat> the tax deductibility of philanthropy was passed. It wasn't that long ago that the tax deductibility for a corporation to give philanthropy was passed. There are a lot of changes. In China today, there's a lot of challenges as in philanthropy because Philanthropies are taxed the same as a company. So there's really no incentive to give money to a philanthropy because it's taxed at the same rate as if it was in your company. There's no benefit. In Japan, 
the requirement that a philanthropy has to invest in Japanese government bonds. So if you have a billion dollar philanthropy that's generating 1%, that would be 10 million, but in Japanese government bonds, you're lucky if you can get a half of 1%. So for every billion you put up, you only can generate $5 million in return, and that's all you can give. There's not a f an incentive also to create a philanthropy from that. So there's a lot of, I think, regulation changes also that are barriers, Rich. And I think it's important to think systemically about philanthropy because there's always a wake you leave behind, the best intention. So even if you, if you cure a disease, look at what's gone on in HIV in Africa. So if the cost of the antiretrovirals are down to $600, but you have a million people afflicted, often these governments don't have $600 million lying around, right? So you have to think through, are you trading the, the cure of a disease that allows people to survive does create the responsibility to create an economy to sustain them, right? So while people are focused singly on one side of that coin or the other, we encourage you to like think through the entirety of the situation. Like, are you going to leave a problem or swap a problem for, for another? So technology often can allow us to transcend these jurisdictions. And those. so Igor, when you think through, just from a pure geographic reach of what you're trying to accomplish, you can really afford the planet access to the system for education. So how are you thinking about legging into that? So yes, the idea, uh, of course, is uh, global. Anybody can sign, can sign up anywhere. Uh, but we're legging into it through uh, regions with the biggest populations that need it the most, uh, China, India, Nigeria, and some other places. And uh, after we get our foot in uh, there, then uh, we'll spread it everywhere else. Well, you covered time. half the world's children just with those three, just about, right? Yes. It's a good place to start. Yes. How do you see, uh, Igor, the, the skill set in uh, quant today around the world? What would be the leading areas of the world? Leading areas uh, probably are China, India, Russia, USA, uh, pretty much the places where we have uh, offices and uh, some smaller places, Hungary, Romania. I noticed Poland is one of few programming Olympics. Uh, do you have many in Poland? Uh, we have not reached Poland yet. So we uh, have a few more minutes. Uh, Tom, what in the time that you've been on your journey in philanthropy, what, what's the biggest lesson you've taken away? Um, I suppose the biggest lesson is that um, use the skills that perhaps got you to have a successful business. Don't throw them out the window and think you need this new set of skills. You've got to keep learning, of course, but the fundamentals in our philanthropy are the same fundamentals in our, um, you know, in our business life. Um, therefore, of course, we need to keep looking for innovation, but the real basics are still there. And um, I guess I just go back to um, Andrew Carnegie and you know, what, what I would want to say to anybody out here today thinking about it is it's, it's, it's not the quantum of, of money. It's definitely not the quantum of money. Um, but the, the absolute high and the enjoyment that we get from um, when a philanthropic venture works is, surpasses any business deal I've ever done. And I don't want to be the richest guy in the graveyard. I don't want to leave a great legacy for someone else to have all the fun. You know, we are, we are pretty selfish. And Andrew Carnegie, with his great statement, he who dies thus rich dies disgraced. I, I really didn't understand that. And it took Vartan Gregorian to really sit me down and educate me. But I really take to that now and say, you know, this is the best fun you can have, the passion that Mike talked about, and do it while you're still alive, because you're a long time dead. <laughs> well, Igor, there's, same question for there's you. another, there's another saying on what Tom okay. said. 
you know, that there's no racks for luggage on a hearse, right? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard that. <laughs> Igor, same question. What lesson, <laughs> even earlier stages, but what have you learned? What have I learned? Uh, I've learned that it's, it's very surprising that this has not been done, because uh, in, in a way, it's, it's, it's very easy to do it. Uh, <laughs> easy for you. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe. And uh, also, there are, there, are, there are a lot of pleasures that come out of it. You know, uh, for example, there is a farmer in uh, China that has uh, signed up for, for our university. And uh, th th this is a guy who, uh, who was a brilliant uh, uh, undergraduate student, but in, in, in China they had laws where you had to go back to the farm or you lose the farm. So before he couldn't do it, and now he can. And uh, that, that kind of uh, outcome gives you uh, satisfaction and gives, uh, give, gives you the validity to, to what you're doing, because you're reaching people who otherwise cannot be reached. Mike, different question for you. You have been uh, involved in this space for, for uh, despite your young age, decades. Uh, <laughs> so what, what do you wish you'd done differently? Um, I think I w wish that I had been more involved personally than giving money early. And so if I look at medical research, in the 70s and the first, most of the 80s, we were funding research, but we weren't involved. And I think we would have been much more effective beginning in the last 25 years. We've been really involved in the process from that standpoint. And I think one of the other things we did do correctly was focus on empowering individuals that had ability. But far more effective, I think, somewhat what Tom was generating by being actively involved. And I think one other thing I think that I would stress that we did correctly is we involved our children early. And I keep this uh, sign on my desk, you're only as happy as your least happy child. And I think having them see the joy and the process of what you can accomplish in philanthropy, what you set out to do. As Tom said at the beginning, there's a real challenge for a person born into wealth. And Neil Ferguson at Harvard you know, often talks about it only takes him a week in a class to identify those students that got in because of their ancestry and those students they got in because of their ability. And he always wonders how long it will be before uh, that person that got in on their ancestry will be working for the person with ability. And so maybe I could just tell one story in 15 seconds, Rich. It was the late 1960s and I was at graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania and there was an individual coming to tell some of the business students how he got to be worth $30 million at 30. And this is 50 years ago, uh, so in today's dollars it would be a lot more. And he said, well, he convinced his parents that he had to go to prep schools associated with the smartest people, went to Wall Street, went to graduate school, went to the best schools associated with the smartest people, and when he was 28, his aunt died and left him 40 million, and that's why he's <laughs> worth 30 million today. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I think there is no amount of wealth you can leave subsequent generations if you haven't given them values and knowledge to be productive in the future. And I, that story, and that day stuck with me uh, to today that. All that, for him, ended up in the destruction of value, not the creation of value. Great. Well, we're out of time. Uh, I want to thank Tom, Mike, Igor for a wonderful panel. And uh, please join us for lunch. Thank you.